know, you've been busy all summer long, so we haven't uh, done this in a while. So it's good to connect. And yeah. uh, it has been a while since we, um, my team here from Newport, um, left the open ocean and uh, went up to Lake George for the big national championship earlier this summer. And man, what a cool place. But um, as ocean sailors, we definitely struggled in the big breeze on the lake. We, uh, you know, I feel like we, we had no idea what we we're doing. So I'm, I'm looking for some help on the next time we go up to Lake George or any other lake um, on what to do when it's windy and weird. Um, so I, you're, you're from the land of lakes. You got to have something for me. Yeah. And I'm also a transplant from Long Island Sound, open water, you know, a little more steady breeze. I wasn't, took me a while to make that transition as well. Now that I live in Lakeland, I've really got some rules of thumb down that are really going to help out. Excellent. Well, I get to it. Um, there's, I guess part of it is right is, uh, the expectations, right? When you go up to a new venue, um, particularly to a lake, uh, how, how do you get into the mindset of, of lake sailing? So I think, you know, when it's, when it's windy and steady, you know, or, or even medium and steady, you sort of have this expectation that, you know, for the most part, if you get a decent start and you hold your lane, you're going to kind of finish your boat speed spot. You kind of know where you are. And if you're good, you're going to be up in that top group most of the time. Uh, something goes wrong. And I think that, you know, when it's lake sailing, my expectation is things will go wrong. I think it's, um, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not like thinking, how do I get rid of mistakes or missing a shift? Uh, I, I know it's going to happen. I'm just trying to do a little better job than the next guy. Hmm. So easy, right? All right. So on the, uh, let's take us out to the start. I mean, um, you, we can do all the pre-race work. We want to check with the locals before you go. You know, you know, every lake has its traits, right? And um, and it's somewhat predictable. I think Lake George was like the left, right, go left, something like that. Um, but once you once you're there, I guess you know it. All all that historical doesn't matter because you've got to go to you know focus on what's happening around you. So when you're sailing up the race course or sailing the first uh, you know lap of the course before the start what's the best way to kind of get a handle on what the wind's doing, especially when it's windy. So especially when it's windy, um, I like to get out there a bit early. Uh, and that, you know, when we're talking about windy, I think for the, for the purpose of this episode, we're kind of kind of split it up into two parts. Uh, next week we're going to do one on the lighter wind. So we're really doing it light to kind of medium. And then when I say heavy, it's really that we're going fast enough. We can get somewhere. We're going close to hull speed. So shifts start to really matter. Um, we had a, you know, did an episode a few weeks ago talking about how important wind was, pressure was, the puff was when it was light, and how important shift was when it's heavy. So we're dividing this into two sections. Today is about the heavy where shift goes. And I think when it's shifty out and windy and, you know, windy enough to kind of be sitting on the rail and moving, yeah, I think you got to get out there early so you can stay, study the nature of the wind. And by that, I mean um, a couple things. One is like, you know, you know, I normally in, in open water, I'd be getting compass numbers. I want to know what the oscillations, I don't even look at the compass and when it's puffy and shifty on a lake, you know, the shifts are so big. If you don't see it, if you're looking at the compass, your eyes are in the boat, but I want to see how those puffs are, are moving. Like, are they coming to me or do I have to go to them? Do I have to sail into them? Are they kind of stationary or are they moving so fast? I actually need to tack before it. So it meets me and, and I go, um, are they the cat's paws? You know, like you got to sail an edge because they're lifted along the edges or are they kind of a straight line? And you got to see a bunch of them. And the pattern for the day is probably the pattern for the day or at least for that time period. And you got to see it play out and see what see how the nature of the wind is for the day. And on top of that, you got to kind of look at the course and is is one side sort of like get you closer to the middle of the lake where it funnels down a little more, it's a little steadier, a little windier. Or as you get to the top, maybe you get closer to land, it gets really shifty and flat. You know, like what's the nature of the edges of the course compared to the start? And then what's it look like toward the end? You know, sometimes there's kind of a geographic shift or a low spot in the land. Do you need to line up with that? Do you need to kind of get that top lefty? You know, um, I could go on and on, but the whole idea is you really want to understand what the wind's doing for that day. Mm. That's a lot. That's a lot to try to figure out in 30 minutes sailing up the beat. But when you, when, what usually takes priority, is it the, you know, the shift patterns, the pup patterns, or the, 
the larger kind of geographical type shifts, like, okay, it's got to be a left side thing. Um, no matter what happens, you just, you got to go one way or the other. Well, you know, I, I often say that as soon as you think you found a pattern in this stuff, you're, you're wrong. Like you're like, oh, the left worked three last three times. You're like, I'm going left. And then the right works. Like what happened? You know, you know, I think you got to shift is so important. If it's a lake and it's puffy and shifty, you know, if, the lake, if the shifts are 20, 30, 40 degrees, you know, like a 45 degree shift, you're laying the mark. Like you can't ignore those shifts. Um, so what I think is it's usually a hybrid, right? Like you see a low spot in the land, left works a little more often than right. Well, I'm not going to take a 30 degree header to get there. But if it's kind of neutral wind, like I'm looking to get there. I'm looking for reasons to get there, but I'm not going to get there at all costs. I'm going to take a shift. Shifts are so important that, you know, think about a 45 degree lift. You're, if you go on the other tack, you're not actually getting any closer to the, to the mark, right? You're literally right. going per perpendicular to the mark. So you, you got to be smart about how you get to something you think is geographic. Mm. And how about being uh, not so reactive to the puff? I mean, it might be a temptation. Like, hey, we're on the Charles River. We're going to tack on every puff. Um, how do you know which ones to to take that little header for a little while to get to where you need to get to or maybe the next one? I mean, without trying to over tack. Yeah. So I, I think there's a time when you could tack a million times, right? Like if it's these cat paws, boom, 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 boom. You know, I, I, that's about studying the nature of the wind. You know, I've, I've done short, even a short course race. Well, I'll tack like 10 times successfully because I'm going to boat the tacks well. And the shifts are so big that I, I sort of have this rule of thumb then that if the puff's coming at me, I'm, it, it's, um, you know, it's probably a header. And I, I decide before it hits, if it's the kind of day, well, first of all, I decide ahead of time when I'm studying the wind, is it the kind of day that I'm going to auto tack? That's a big thing. So if the wind is moving quickly to you, I auto tack. Puff's coming in front of you. It's likely a header and it, it hits you. And as soon as your jib lofts, instead of bearing off and then deciding you're going to tack, you know, like then you tack, you bear it off and tack, just use it as part of your tack. You're already like luffing. You might as well just turn that extra 30 degree, you know, probably 60 degrees instead of 90 and you auto tack. So there's two factors. One is you got to decide by studying the wind, whether it's an auto tack day. And then as you're going up the course, you're deciding whether you actually want to auto tack. Just for example, you're way lifted. You're on the long tack where you want to be. You're like, I'm not going to auto tack in this next. I'm really near the ley line. I'm not going to auto tack unless it's gigantic. Right. Or the opposite. I'm looking for a reason to go. I like the geography on the right. This is even a hint of an auto tag. I'm just going to go. Hmm. Got to have a quick other trip. Times, yeah. And other <laughs> times the, the nature of the wind is it's sort of filling in progressively and it's moving slowly. So you get the hint of the auto tag and you're like, no, today's not an auto tag day. I need to sail into it further to like get really into the shift. And then I'm in it. If you tack too soon, there's that fleeting feeling like the front edge hasn't filled in and you just get headed right again. It's really not there yet. Hmm. But that's where you're that's what you're studying when you're looking at the wind before the race what am i going to do with these puffs do i need to sail into them do i need to sell the edges because they're sprawling do i need to auto tech Oof. quick movements can't like on the trimmers there you gotta be yeah good. but that's why but that's why you need to decide this before the race because you you got it in your head you're okay today's an auto tech day if in doubt you just tack and if you're wrong you tack back no no harm no foul Right. Or is it the day you got to sail into it because you just then, you know, you're not auto tag and you're just going to suck it up and get right into it till you're in the meat of the puff and or the shift. And then you go. But good awareness for the rest of the team to know that it's going to be an auto tag day as well. So be ready for it. You know, um, yeah. correct. And that's the discussion I have with my team is um or myself when i'm single-handed <laughs> talk to myself i'm like okay that looks like a gigantic puff all right guys if that's uh if this is a header at all we're just gonna auto attack mm -hmm. uh i remember sailing j24 and that stuff down in lake murray in south carolina it was one of these crazy puffy days and my tactician would just like look at me in the eye and say, do not tack if this is an auto tack. You know, if this is a giant header, keep going. I do because he didn't he didn't like what he saw over my shoulder. 
Or he'd be like, look at me. He says, as soon as you get any hint, we're looking for a reason to tag you. Any hint, go. go. So the conversation of what you're going to do uh, is really important because if they know you're not attacking, they'll keep hiking. If you know you're, it's going to be crazy and maybe attack and everybody stops hiking and like, okay, go. <laughs> so you don't get teabagged, right? Yeah, I'm going to teabag. Um, so to both, but both speed, let's talk about that quickly, you know, in, in terms of this, when it's windy and weird, um, where does boat speed come into the equation? Well, you know, it, it, it matters. And, um, but it doesn't matter so much that you need to take your, like, I think when it's really steady, I focus like 90% of my attention on boat speed. It's boat speed, you know, boat speed, boat speed, boat speed. Every once in a while, you're ready to compass, take a quick look around. Yep, boat speed, boat speed, boat speed. That's that, right? And uh, I think when it's puffy and shifty, you know, my eyes are out of the boat a lot more. First of all, it helps with boat speed because I see with little puffs and lulls in the water. So I'm ready for them. I can react to them quickly, you know, dump the main or whatever I got to do. But, you know, in the end, boat speed, actual boat speed still matters. And uh, and the reason is, that, you know, the person who wins the race and that stuff usually wins by a lot, right? And steady wind, you know, inches matter. Where, you know, you might, after an hour of racing, you might be just a couple boat lanes apart, you know, and this is going to be tens of boat lanes apart. But you know what a little bit of boat speed does is it gets you free of your group. Then when you you have the option to tack in that auto tack, like, you know, if you're slow and you get sucked in, you got to wait for them to tack. And then your turn comes. Now you're behind and that's when you get the distance made on you. So. That makes me think of a thing, I and mean, it's maybe getting granular, so we get it quick though. You know, if you know it's going to be a uh, kind of auto tacky kind of day, it's going to be a lot, a lot of movement. Would you set up the boat? Let's go to J twenty fours. Would you set it up differently um, for more sort of acceleration of attacks versus uh, straight line boat speed? Yeah, so I think that the short answer to that question is I set up for the lulls. I look at it a little differently than that. I um, I set up for the lightest wind. So I guess that's related. You're asking about boat handling, but I think it's all related, right? So I feel like I can struggle through a puff and you're going pretty quick. You know, maybe if it was really windy like that the whole time and you had more power than the next guy and they were depowered correctly, they would inch out on you. But I think that when the lull comes, you know, if you're over baked, we call it, right? You're, if you're too depowered, you really struggle to get through those lulls. And that's to me where the gains are made. Like it gets you to that next puff shift where you're ripping and you struggle through that and then you get through that again. So I'm always setting up for the um, for the lulls. Mm. That reminds me, similar to this Lake George ex experience that we had, um, the, you know, the sense of the, you know, the starting line so far away from the shore, but the mark is up against the shore. You know, when you're you're sort of waiting in the pre-start, and oh, man, it feels windy. You know, around this edge of which which sail did we go with? And but then you realize halfway up the beat, it's it's definitely on the low side. So, um, but the, yeah, so setting up for the lulls or the, or the lighter further up the beat. Yeah, and and yeah, in your case, it was sort of gets more lully up the beat, right? And um, you know, there's sort of this theory that maybe, uh, you know, the the J24 is kind of a special case because you can have a jib or a Genoa. Um, you know, maybe you can tack a little better with the jib. So if it's right on the edge, maybe I'd go with the jib so I could tack better. But I would, if I thought it was faster to have the Genoa, I still would go with the Genoa to get me through those lulls. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that translates to every boat too. You know, you, I would down tune my rig, you know, my shrouds or whatever your deep power tools are on your boat, chocks, mass step, mass ram, whatever it is that powers your boat up and down. I would definitely gear it toward the lulls. All right, let's, um, when it's windy and weird, let's, let's walk through a typical race that you might run. Um, how would you set yourself up on the start knowing that, um, you know, we're in this scenario of a weird- Yeah, so maybe I'll quickly draw this on the uh, on the whiteboard if you're right with that. Yeah, go for it, yeah. See it all right there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we have kind of your, your, your pin in your boat, so yeah. You have your pin and your boat is over here, right? And you got your line. You know, I think the temptation is to try to start at an end. Like, suppose you got a righty. We'll make that green. 
you know, you're like, ah, oh, big righty, you know, we got a 20 degree shift. I want to start, this is the favorite end. I want to start here. And um, I, I, typically, I typically in a shifty day, try to avoid that. I, I'll start somewhere in this middle third of the line almost every time. And the reason is that this is going to shift back. So as long as the line is sort of set to the average of the wind, I'm not trying to start at the favorite end. What I am trying to do is make sure I get on the long tack first. So what I'll do is I'll kind of hang out right around here until really late. You know, I'm just going back and forth and I'm deciding if I'm going to start here or here. Now, if it was super light, we can talk about that next week. I might go to where I think the first puff is. I might go to an end of lighter air. But when it's shifty like this, if I start here and then I eventually get a big header, well, then I'm in good shape, right? It's like the other end was favored already. Like it gets you in phase. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to, I'm not trying, I'm really just trying to get clear air and go so I can be on that long tack. And what I mean by the long tack is, you know, the tack that's closer to the mark. Like if I'm looking forward in my window here, you know, by my jib, if I see the mark in my, if I don't have to turn around to look at my mark, then I'm on the long tack. Hmm. So that's the priority to me. And you're, you're never winning like here at that point, one side or the other is ahead of you, but you just keep doing that up the beat, taking the shifts. And all of a sudden there's just a few people left. Hmm. And hopefully there are a different few each race because you've done the conservative thing by doing the long tack. Interesting. So I know you're, you're, you're looping uh, upwind of the line. Is that your preferred when it's windy and weird? I do. I do. I loop above the line so I can see, I'm not worried about traffic. And then I'll just, um, I'll just kind of dip down late, you know, so let's get rid of some of these things. Yeah. So let's just take a time when, um, you know, a minute to go, I'm here. I'm like, I, okay, good. It looks like a nice righty. I'll just find a nice open spot on the line, tack in at 30 seconds or so. And because I'm here and it's shifty and weird, you know, it's hard for people to set up correctly in the line. There's often more holes. Like I'm not that worried about being able to find a hole. So yeah, maybe a minute or something I'm doing this. By making a decision like a minute and a half in a bigger fleet, a minute in a smaller fleet, and I'm just just finding a nice hole somewhere in this range. Yeah. Getting on the course. That's a great tip. I mean, that's one of those things of you know, why 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 get stuck in the rush hour traffic when you can uh be on the expressway back and forth looking for looking for an exit, right? Well, if you're the one that starts here on this um you know, if you, if you're fighting for the boat end, you know, the problem is that it's going to shift on you. Right. So you all look good here. You're like, Oh, I'm killing all those guys at the pin, you know, all the way down here, they tack their way behind, but you know, it's shifty. So it's going to go neutral. And then all of a sudden you're down here. Well, now they're here and they can cross you. Right. So, you know, it, it I think you got to start more toward the middle and then center up and then worry about it later and in this case you're you're like let's go back to like try to ignore the compass but just keep the bow pointed toward the mark um and uh yeah let's explore that for a second so let's let's kind of like shrink this down so it's like we look at the course view right so if this is the starting line we'll just get rid of these babies at least i think i will um Right. So if you got this and you're going up the course, to me, I shouldn't have gotten rid of the mark. So this is now the mark, right? So this is the weather mark. To me, what you want to do, I said before, I don't really, I don't use the compass. And because the compass is going to get your head in the boat. So I prefer to go like long tack. So what I mean by that is if I'm sailing up the course here, and I said it before that if if I'm on the boat, right, and I'm looking and I can look, this is me, right? <laughs> right. And I look forward and it's sort of in my range of vision, I'm on the long tack. Mm -hmm. And then I get a header. Well, now I have to turn my head around a little bit. I tack. Now I'm on the long tack again. Get a little header, Oop, a little short tack. 
So what it does is it's sort of this, this genius way not to get stuck on an edge. Mm. If you follow the compass and it's sort of trending right for that whole leg, you're going to find yourself in the left corner because you never really get a header. So you're going to find yourself here taking this giant header back. Mm. Is it a good rule of thumb that that uh, on lake sailing, is it better to, I guess this would be when it's windy, uh, to sail the middle of the course versus get to the edges? So, yeah, um, I think the lighter it is, the more you're going to have to sail to an edge and we can really, because you're looking for pressure. If there's just more pressure on an edge, you got to get there, yeah. depending on the nature of the wind. Yeah. Um, so without land effect, absolutely sail right up the middle, I think. Um, if there's some sort of geographic effect that you sort of got to get somewhere, like suppose you have a shore over here, you know, like, you know, there's some land over here or something. And, you know, the, the breeze sort of in a low spot. So you have a little more breeze and lefties. I'll make them red. So you see, got some, in general, the wind is sort of more this way here and a little bit stronger. And you really want to get here. So we discussed this before that, you know, beautiful. Like I'm on a big righty right now, right? In our little thing here. But what if I started in a big lefty? What do I do? Well, I think the answer is if it's a giant lefty, you have to take the, the long tack, like you're pointing at the weather mark, right? If it's sort of neutral or even just a little header, you know, I mean, a little lift, if it's a small lift, then you're more likely to head this way. Like I'm looking for anything even close to a header. Neutral, it's only up in my mind, you know, like five degrees. I'm sort of centered up on the mark. I'll work my way this way in the puffs, but I'm not going to start here and go all the way here. There's going to be some gigantic shifts on this along the way, mm. if I do. Cool. Well, now that you've got the the illustration, I want to just sort of take a uh, step backward to uh, intersecting the puffs that you talked about earlier. Um, maybe you could sketch it out for those of, you know, how, yeah. to, how to react to a puff. Um, I mean, you got somebody calling puffs on the rail. Um, hey, this looks like a header or a lifter puff. Maybe uh, what does that mean? Yeah. So, you know, I think sometimes the puffs kind of look like, like this, right? Like the nature of the puffs are so different. So if you have kind of this, this blob kind of puff, right? These, these bombs, you know, these are the cat paws, right? And what's really happening in is they're kind of hitting the water and spreading. So the edges are, are lifts, right? So if, you, if that's the nature of the day, you know, connecting these is the way to go. So what you try to do is, um, you know, you sail to this. So let's go back to our, our race here. You know, like, you know, suppose it's a neutral wind. So we'll just kind of get us off the line here draw our path. So suppose it's sort of like even on the line, I start in the middle and this first puff comes along. Or maybe I'll start a little more toward the left end, the left third, because this puffs on this side. And then I'll, this is probably moving quickly and it's a big lefty. So on this edge, so I'll take this edge and then I'll try to take it to this one. So I get a big header and so on. I'll connect these puffs sailing the edges. You know, if this puff were here instead, you know, then these would be, then it would be the other side, right? I take this lift up. I don't know what just happened there. <laughs> right? So then, you know, you want to sail whichever edge you can get to. So then you have a choice here, which edge you want to go. Am I going to, and usually it's not up to you. It's, it's, it's rare that it comes straight at you. You have a, you either, you know, it's skewed one way or the other. So you're sort of stuck with whichever edge is kind of coming your way. Do you, do you, you know, what's the, like, do you dig a little more into the puff to get more breeze in the middle of it? If it's a big one or you go right on the edge, what's your preference? Well, this is the nature of the day puff like this is where your homework really pays 
So if the nature of the day, if if the day, if it's the kind of day that when you study this puff, there are these blobs that, you know, cat paws, right? We always call them. Then they're moving. You got to attack, you know, kind of as soon as you get the first hint. These are the auto attack. This is, you know, auto attack, you know. Yes. <laughs> you know, as soon as there's a hint of that, you're just going to attack. Now, there's other days that are very different, right? So if you have a, a different kind of day, might have more of like a line text, right? So I don't know why I can't get rid of that. So we're not going to worry about that for now. So, you know, suppose you have like some really big line of wind over here. So maybe the day is more like the puffs look kind of like you know, like this instead. They're like lines of wind. So maybe there's a big righty here with a puff that's more like this. You know, maybe on the really macro scale, if you went up in an airplane, it would be a big blob, but it's just too big. You know, it's going to go and stay there for a while. Well, this might be one you need to sail a little further into. Maybe this is a little more stationary. It's coming off a hill. Maybe this is geographic. Right. So it's kind of hitting the water and then bouncing up. So that's when you've done your homework and you've decided, hey, I really need to sail into this. Right. I need to go. And this time I need to like dig in. So the nature of the day is we're going to dig into this puff, get into the meat of it where it's nice and strong, and then we can take it because the front edge might be kind of fluky. So the day depend. The day is going to tell you, like, if this edge is not, not a solid line, it's not moving hard and fast at you, you're going to have to dig in. And the good news is that when you do your homework, you know, the nature of the wind for the day is more or less kind of the nature of the wind for the day. You kind of get a feel for it when you sail that first leg and you do your homework. But this is, you got to dig into these puffs today. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because in most cases, we're not, we're only on the water for a, a fixed amount of time might be four, four or five hours, right? You know, first race at 10, we're off the water at three. That the not much is going to happen big picture in those five hours. Yeah. And almost for sure, the first race is going to be like your homework was. And then, you know, if something changes, then you got to change your strategy. You got to think, okay, hey, the day is changing. You know, one example of that is often when the, you know, might be a little bit more like this early on. And then as the land heats up, the water, the air gets all turbulent, right? There's all these little mini, you know, thermal plumes, as uh, Chelsea Carlson, the weather, you know, <laughs> always says, you know, and, and as it gets, the land heats up, and if the wind's going over the land, later in the day, you might get more and more randomness. Mm. Oh, I'm often thinking about that. How might it change today as time goes on? Or maybe the, the weather changes completely. Maybe this shuts down and the thermal takes over. Or maybe a front comes through, but you're, you're trying to decide what the nature of the wind is for the next race. Okay, cool. Um, so that said, what uh, what would be some of your rules of thumb for uh, windy, weird lake sailing? Now that we've sort of gone through this exercise. All right. Um, Knowing that so, we haven't even gone downwind yet, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I do think uh, downwind is is a little simplified, but we can talk about that in a minute. But, um, you know, I think that when it's light wind, uh, wind is priority. And that's why it's pretty different than what I'm talking about now and worth its own episode. Uh, so shift is the priority. And the reason for that is that you're already kind of going pretty fast. A puff isn't going to make you go that much faster. If it's lake sailing, they're gigantic shifts, you know. The wind isn't as important as the shift. That's the first one. The second one is that long tack theory. Rule of thumb is you always take the long tack first. Like if you get this big, you know, maybe it's initially a lefty and you start to sail and that's wrong, <laughs> but you got this big lefty. You know, what I do is I look at it as if I'm not on the long tack and doing something, you know, I, I better have a good reason. So in this case, you know, the wind is probably there, right? 
So I look at it as this is the center of the course right now. Right. Right. So I like to define the center of the course at any one moment, what the wind is, and that can change as it shifts. So right now I'm over to the left. I'm looking for a reason to get back. And that's the genius of the long tack. And suppose I get here and then this, finally this giant righty comes in and I go like this. Well, now the axis has changed. So this is no longer the center of the course. You know, all the while the center of the course for the course sake is right down the middle. Now we have this righty. Let's so uh, we'll make that green. You know, so now the wind's here. The center of course is all the way over here now. I'm exaggerating, of course, but maybe not. It could be this radical. Well, now I'm all over on the right side of the course and I'm looking for a reason to get back. Cool. How about tactically? Just real quick on, you know, how do you overlay just interaction with fleet sailing, you know, ducking, but just trying to sail your own race um, and being able to take advantage of these shifts? So the... The steadier it is, open water sailing, I play the fleet a lot, right? I want to go a little left. I think I'm in neutral. Which tack should I be in? I look around. Uh, there's a lot more boats on the right. I better not go all the way left, right? I, I really play the fleet. It can be conservative. I'm still on the left of the majority. If this, the shift comes in like I think it does, or the geography is what I think it is, I'm still going to be ahead of the majority, right? So... I, I think about the fleet a lot. I try really hard not to think about the fleet when it's um, puffy and shifty. The only thing, the only reason I look at the fleet is I think they're fantastic indicators. Oh, there's a puff coming. Those boats ahead just got really headed. It's going to be a header, right? Um, or look on the left. They look really light and slow. Okay, there's not much wind over there. But beyond that, I, I'm willing to sail in dirty air, I'm willing to, you know, if in doubt, I duck. Like if I'm on port and this big gigantic lift and there's like two boats coming, even though it's a gigantic duck, I'll duck anyway. And uh, the reason for that is that I'm on port for a reason. And the same thing with uh, sailing in dirty air. Okay, I'm going to lose a boat length by ducking. I'm going to lose boat length in dirty air. If I get out of phase in 30 degree shifts, 20 degree shifts, I'm going to lose 10 bolt lights. So I'm willing to sit there in dirty air. I'm willing to duck. Whatever I can do, I kind of ignore, besides indicators, I do exactly what I want to do with the wind I'm in and what I see. I don't let the, the fleet dictate anything I do, which is hard to do. Yeah. Um, okay, we let's... Uh... Cover down went quick because I actually I don't want to leave that a big part of it, right? Because you can uh, the gains are certainly to be made there as well. So I think the biggest thing downwind is uh, to realize let's let's just say that you have this shift. Let's just take this exact scenario that we still have on the whiteboard here, and let's you know take the upwind out of it. This this puff is coming. And this, this line is slowly moving down, right? So now we got the, the, the line here. And so you better decide right as you're getting, you know, a few boat lanes, 10 boat lanes, five boat lanes out from the weather mark. What's your first move out of the, out of the mark? And if it's breezy, it's almost always going to be the long tack downwind too. So if the wind is to the right of the rum line, you're going to jive. If it's the left of the run line, you're going to do a straight set and you're going to just bear off, bear away. So you want to get on this other course, like on the on the, the tack that takes you straight downwind, straight to the blue mark, right? So we're, we're saying the blue mark's down here now. You got to make that decision before you round. That first move, instantly get on port tack in this case, right? to take advantage of the shift. Now, the interesting thing about downwind is you're gonna have half as many shifts. Like if you got five shifts upwind, you're only gonna get two downwind because you're going with the wind. So you have time after you do that to go decide what to do next. But almost always downwind, I take the long tack just like upwind, except I try to hedge straight. In this case, the wind's here, right? 
try to head straight to the mark when I can. And I'll modify my, my course a little bit. Oh, if I go a little higher, I'll get some more breeze. And then as soon as I get the breeze, I go down. And then when the new shift finally comes in, I'll jive and do the same thing. Um, do you, uh, are you opposed to, in, in the, let's say, burning this fanning puff zone versus the, uh, you know, wind, wind line, um, making pretty dramatic course corrections to try to connect with the puffs as they're coming? Is, or do you just wait for them to come to you? No, oh, I definitely am willing to change my course pretty dramatically. So let's go. So you're 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 balancing. If you see wind coming in like a line, you're balancing how high do I go to go get it, and then I take it down. Um, with how long you think that's going to last, and how stationary is it? If it's pretty stationary. It's worth going up for that line. But your question about what to do in cat's paws. Suppose you're in a in a this first shift is because you have the cat's paw. Right. So suppose you're in this puff that's local and you got that nice shift, but it's really looks like this in the puff. Well, at some point, this is going to go away. It's going to outrun you or vice versa. Like you're going to sail out of this. Like you're sailing in this for a while because you're moving with it. Right. So hopefully you take it for a while, but suppose it goes away and then the next one's here. You know, you see it coming from behind. What I do is is I will do a pretty radical change of course to go to go make that happen. Like that extra pressure, unlike upwind where you're trying to go in hull speed, I think there's pretty dramatic changes in speed downwind when you get a puff and you can go lower. So I might jive over, go by the lee, whatever I got to do to get to that puff. And then I'll take it down. So one of the big things I see people do wrong is they get to the puff and they just get greedy and they want more. They're like, oh, I'm going so fast. I'm kind of reaching. As soon as you start feeling the puff, it's coming to you usually. Um, and you're going to you're going to stay in it so much longer if you just take it straight down right away. I spend as much time as I can once I get to the puff trying to head directly at the mark. Yeah, so, like so I you want to make sense right to the mark. Yeah. As soon as you feel the pressure or your trimmer, you know, yeah, there's just that little bit of breeze in, in the sheet. Carve yes. it down one of the marks. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Carve it down. And then I head at the mark. And then whichever jive I should be on, I'm I go on. Right. I head the mark. Maybe it's a big shift and I don't need the jive. Maybe I do. But once I'm in the puff, I try to head right to the mark take that distance to the mark in that puff and I'll modify that a little bit. If the puff's moving and I can stay in it a little longer by going a little further, I might do that. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I feel people sail off course too much downwind, getting a little too greedy for more. Take what you got to the mark. And then as that starts to wane, okay, what do I need to line up for next? Cool. All right. Conclusions. What, um, what should be our takeaways? Um, we've gone upwind, downwind, uh, weird, windy lake sailing. What would be the the overall conclusions for this topic? All right, let me uh, stop sharing so we can kind of just talk about it. You know, I think the main conclusion to me is that um, you know it's a very different mental mindset. You know, my expectation is I'm going to have you know people ahead of me a lot. Like if I do this up the middle thing, you know, somebody that took a risk and went all the way to the left is going to be 50 yards ahead. And, um, you know, hopefully next race they're in, you know, the bottom third of the fleet because they tried to do it again. And it didn't work. And so you got to be thinking long-term and not race by race. And I'm always amazed. Like, I didn't even think I sailed that well. And you're like way ahead in a regatta because you have all top fives or something but you don't have any win. You're not winning anything, right? If I'm winning races, I'm feel like I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> I'm taking too much risk, right? <laughs> you know, like well, so the rest of us would just be happy to winning races, but you know, yeah. If you're trying to, if, you know, if that makes you, if that floats your boat, great. But if you're trying to win a, you know, the the series, then you got to kind of hang in there. So that's the first one. So which to me means patience, and you can't freak out when, because a lot of times you'll see like the left winning. And you're like, oh, they just beat me over there. And you chase it over there. But you don't have that win. You can't get there. You're taking a header to get there. 
And now the right comes in. It's, now it's their turn. You just gave up that side. So I think it's the look ahead. They're just indicators. Like if the left worked and it looks like it's going to work even more, sure, I'll dig in. But, you know, most of the time it's like, ah, I'm going to take the edge of that and I lost them, but that's okay. You know, they won't be there next time. Um, another conclusion is related, which is patterns. Like I think people always try to, uh, last weekend I sailed, you know, this fluky stuff and somebody said the left worked, didn't it? And I'm like, sometimes, you know, maybe 60% of the time, but you know, as soon as you find a pattern, you're probably wrong. Believe in the nature of the wind and sail to that. That is your pattern, not whether left or right worked. Mm. Um, and with that, you just plug away. And you sail the wind, the scores will take care of themselves. Like as soon as you start thinking about like, oh, that guy's going to beat me in this series if he gets another first, then you've probably lost. <laughs> there you go. There's your uh, Inga moment of Zen there, right? Just uh, sail your own race, right? Sail your own race. Yep. Perfect. All right. Well, like next time we meet, I guess we'll cover the, the light and weird, which is um, always a fun one. Yeah. It takes even more patience, at least in heavier when you're losing your, it happens quickly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Awesome. We look forward to it. Um, thanks again for all your wisdom as always. Love it. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Mike.